Well, hello, my friends. I am Humberto Fernandez, your real estate agent in the Riviera Maya. And today it is a very special day for me. As for today, I have a very special guest today here in the channel. She is Natalia Vital, and she is the trust specialist at Intercam Bank. Now, the trust, the thing about the trust is that Uh, I think it's one of the subjects that I get asked about a lot because every foreigner that, that wants to buy a property in the premium zones of the, of the Riviera Maya and all of the coastal lines for that matter, they need to have a, a bank trust. And so today here, Natalia, she's an expert. She's here to let us know all about the Fideicomiso. So hello, Natalia, how are you doing? Hello, hello, everybody. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very happy for this enormous invitation. And yes, I'm here to answer all of your questions regarding the trust and restricted zone trust, particularly, which is the one that we're here for. Um, and yeah, very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. As, and as I just said, Natalia, she's been working at Itancap for a long time. She's an absolute expert in the thing of the uh, Fideicomiso. She's done, I don't know how many. So if you have any questions that by well, any chance we don't, we don't uh, talk about, you can always leave them in the comments and we will make sure that Natalia gets those comments and we get, we'll get back to you. So in any case, uh, I, I think it is better to just start saying like, Why, Natalia, why do foreigners need a bank trust to own property in the premium zones of, of uh, the coastal lines of Mexico? Yeah, that is a very interesting point and very interesting question. And I believe first it is important for us to think about the history, about the history in terms of why, when did it start it? And it was even years and years ago in 1971. Uh, when they approved the law of the foreign investment law in our constitution and through the disposition article 27 and this was because Mexican constitution itself banned foreign ownership of any land within the restricted zone that is located in the land what is a restricted zone it is it's a land located within the 100 kilometers of any national border and 50 kilometers away from the ocean and This law was implemented because a lot of notaries, a lot of investors, foreign investors, um, pretty much recognize that there is a huge opportunity of investment in Mexico coastlines. So it was obviously for Mexico, a huge opportunity of investments to have foreigners looking for more and more opportunities here uh, of a real estate investment. So by those means, they implemented this law and they implemented obviously as a transparency um, for them to be able to acquire a, uh, a real estate according to a foreign law investment that protects them. And also, of course, um, to not be able to go against Mexican law. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because as far as I understand it, and everything, it happened like around the 70s. But as you say, just going back a little bit, the law stated that the borderlines could not be sold to foreigners. Why is that? Well, just for a, for a question of sovereignty and preserving the national territory, that's perfect. However, Uh, in the 70s, and something that, that happened in the 70s was actually that Cancun, the Cancun area was starting to be developed. And there was a lot of foreign investment that wanted to pitch in, that wanted in, in the game of developing in the Riviera Maya and the Cancun area. And they stumbled again the, against this law, saying that they, as foreign investors, could not own property, which is, if I may say so, pretty dramatic because if you're going to make a multi-billion dollar investment in an hotel like the ones that we already have there, Barcelona, Rio, whatnot, you need to have a certain legal certainty that that investment that you're doing is going to be protected and that it's going to be safe and that you're going to be able to keep it and all of that. And so that's exactly why the uh, the the, uh, the the Fideicomiso or Bank Trust Law gets gets pushed out on the on the Congress, which is a, some means to, well, work that situation out. The Mexican government will be able to obtain those that foreign investment on the one hand, but on the other hand, those foreign investors would be able to, to have their interests protected and be under the, uh, well, on, on the, 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 the umbrella of the law, knowing that all of their investment is, is right. So just 
I, I know the Fideicom me, so it's, it's a long thing, and, and I've seen them, and I mean, so it's a long contract. But what, why don't you tell us, like, the, the basic concepts that you would see in one of those uh, Fideicomisos Bank Trusts agreements? Yeah, and just to sum a little bit on what you mentioned previously, it was until the 1994 where the new foreign investment law allowed a beneficiary to have a trust that it would be 50 year within the application or the extension of being renewed and uh, still stay intact. So um, that was just an add up on what you just mentioned. And at the end of the day, the Fideicomiso is important for you guys to know that it is a contract and it is a contract where a few parties are involved. Those are the main concepts. The, co the parties that are going to be involved are the beneficiary, the bank institution that will serve as a trustee, Uh, the seller, which is going to be the settler, in this case, can either be an uh, individual or a legal entity, same as the beneficiary. It can be a legal entity or an individual. And, of course, the beneficiary substitutes that the beneficiary, which is a foreign buyer, is able to designate in case of their passings. So those are the parties involved. And the concept itself is contract that provides the foreign buyer um, the opportunity to buy their property through this this um, this legal instrument. And also in case of their passing, there is several beneficiary substitutes and this legal instrument is formalized under, under a notary and can be, it is obviously a contract that provides the um, the foreigner to have total use and enjoyment of their property, to be able to sell it, to be able to rent it, to be able to name new beneficiaries, transfer the property either to a foreign or a national individual or entity. And also that they have in consideration all of these qualities and concepts, because sometimes that's the uncomfort, like the, um, maybe this feeling of um, having to not be comfortable with having to do it through a bank trust. But it's a completely transparent, transparent uh, legal instrument that people and foreigners can do it by purchasing a property here in Mexico, specifically in the restricted zone region that I just mentioned. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because here, here there's something interesting. The other alternative, I mean, the alter the unofficial alternative to the Fideicomiso is relying on someone you know you care, you know, because at the end, in very broadly say, you need a Mexican entity to be in the title for that property. So before the Fideicomiso law, it would be your compadre, your friend, uh, Pepe, Jose, that you met somewhere, uh, your spouse, your girlfriend, boyfriend with the big uh, little thing that relationships tend to change over time. So you wouldn't have a lot of legal certainty in that regard. So the alternative in why the Fideicomiso law and the Fideicomisos themselves are so effective, it's because instead of trusting in a Mexican individual, here you're signing a contract with a well-established Mexican institution. And that contract is actually taken before a notary public. So then it's of, of public record. So there's no way way of, of losing the rights that you got in that contract and as you were saying Natalia at the end there's a lot of things that that come in that in that contract like uh, you can inherit it uh, you cannot lose it you can sell it there's there are a lot of things but uh, we will get into that right now I'm gonna make a very simple and clear question that honestly every time every time that I post something related to the fideicomiso I kind of get these, these, uh, these comments or every time I bring that up in a conversation, and this is very simple, is uh, can you lose your property that you get, that you title with a fideicomiso? The government can come one night and snatch your property away once that you uh, title it with a fideicomiso? In this case, no. That's, that's, the, that's one of the advantages of the fideico fideicomiso to be a legal instrument formalized under a notary public. Um, a lot of people, um, a lot of foreigners or whoever that comes and wants to know a little bit about even the authority that a notary public have in Mexico, 
it is a little, quite different than in other uh, countries. The notary public, and I'm mentioning the impact that this authority has in order for them to know the impact that this contract has towards the property and towards the people that are signing it. The notary public here in Mexico, it's an authority that gives, has um, complete legal faith and complete um, legality to authentic, authentic documents to, that has to obviously sign the contract and obviously any, any type of contract that is formalized under this notary public has complete legal like legality in the country. And as well, it's not only a legal instrument formalized under a public proper, under a public notary, but also it is inscribed under a public of property registry, which is obviously gives it even more certainty that, okay, it is a contract that you're signing. You are the main beneficiary. There is a Mexican legal institution uh, that is signing as well through their dele de delegate representative, but there is also the uh, volunteer of two parties, seller and the beneficiary, as well as the notary public. So by all of this little uh, speech that I just gave, uh, there is no way for you to lose it once this has been already executed. So. If there is a, in a specific, obviously, case or in a specific circumstance where, um, I don't know, there has been a lawsuit or other things implied, then that would be subject for um, the specific lawyer to review. But by those means, everything very general you cannot lose your property through the bad trust. Perfect. Excellent. No, and what you're mentioning is something actually quite interesting because one of the other questions that I get asked a lot is like, do I not need a lawyer to, to review the documents and whatnot? I want to say, well, maybe if you're on your own being Mexican, maybe you should in certain instances, not always, but let's say, okay, the, the, the resource is there. But as a foreigner that you're saying, oh, wow, I have no idea of which documents and how does that work? And you can just go ahead, obviously. You can always go, 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 uh, procure yourself a lawyer to, to go through the documents. But since you're going to be doing things through, through a fideicomiso, and trust me on this one, guys, the bank is not going to sign anything that is not squeaky clean on every corner. They have lawyers that are specialists in, in looking around these real estate contracts, real estate documentation. So yeah, obviously you can just go and get your lawyer for you for yourself. But trust me, if you want, if you, actually, if you want the lawyers of the bank working for you, the fideicomiso is a little strategy that, that you can absolutely uh, use there if you want to have more certainty as for the legality of the property that, that you're buying. That's important. So just to to to, to come up with the, with the next uh, subject, because this is important. So what are the legal rights that, that, that the trust beneficiary beneficiaries have? I mean, we know that uh, they can inherit it, that they can sell, that they can lease. And on the other hand, the bank cannot do anything that's right i mean there are the 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 the, uh, the rights of the legal of the bank are pretty much none they're just going to put their name there in the beneficiary is going to have all of those rights what are those rights that the beneficiary have yeah so you mentioned them perfectly i mean you just mentioned a beneficiary has full use and enjoyment as if it was the owner they have the right to sell the property and once they have their trust, super important, once they have the trust set up with the Mexican bank authorized to, authorized to act as a trustee, it is very important that they know that the trusts are not assets of the book of the bank, nor the bank is allowed to take any action without written instructions from the beneficiary. The act, the, Me the Mexican bank authorized to act as a trustee, in this case, for example, Intercan Bank, can only do this type of um, faculties or legal rights that are written down by the beneficiaries. That's super, super important. And by those means, the beneficiary have the legal, um, legal rights to instruct the Mexican bank to either sell the property to, uh, well, the renting out of the property doesn't need any 
written instructions. They can just rent it out itself. And that is written down in the contract that is established in the contract. They are able to, if they nationalize themselves as Mexicans, they are able to terminate the trust. They are able to even, if they want to add a new property into their existing trust, they are able to do so. They would just need to send again written instructions to the bank to do this type of modifications. And also they are able to designate or change their beneficiary substitutes if it was the case. Um, they are able to sell this property, as I mentioned, to any other foreign individual or legal entity. Because uh, we, at the LLC or any other entity and Inc. can also be a beneficiary in this trust. And that's super important. Um, there's obviously a list of requirements that they need to comply with. That's another aspect that we're going to be talking about. But these are the legal rights that they have towards the property. Full use and enjoyment. The only thing is that they need to instruct the trustee if they are working with a real estate attorney or a closing coordinator, or if they're working on this, having to do this modification by themselves, the first person that they need to come to is their trustee specialist at the bank, which in this case at Intricant Bank is my Okay, I, ha I have a, need, uh, a little question. The bank can they because you, can deny himself because you were saying okay it's just as simple as sending the instruction. So let's say that I buy my property as a foreigner. Ten years from now, I call hey Mr. Bank, uh, you know I want to sell. The bank can tell me no, you can't. Or ten years from now, hey Mr. Bank, you know what I got in a fight with my beneficiary and now I want to leave everything to my cat. Can the bank tell me no? I mean, as long as I ask for something under the law, obviously, <laughs> but the law. can the bank say, yeah, yeah, I cannot, something, you know, absurd, but something legally doable. Can the bank tell me no? The trust, that's the fun part of the trust that sounds fun. The beneficiary, the beneficiary has full use and enjoyment and legal right towards the trust. So when I say um, written instructions is For them to be able to, um, since the bank is the one, the one that helps the property itself through this through this trust, that's why it is. Um, that's why the beneficiary has a responsibility to instruct the bank to do so. As long as you mentioned that is according to law, their request it is going to be permitted. And of course, another thing to consider that this may be your one of your questions, but or we may mention it. They need to be on to date with their annual fees. As long as that happens and he, the beneficiary is ready to go to do any modification that they would love to. Okay, perfect. No, yeah, and, and we will be talking about the, the, the fees because there are a couple of charges. There's a, a, a foreign affairs uh, permit that you need to get and there are administrative fees and whatnot. We can we can get, get to that in a second. But I think a, a relevant question for me is how long does it take? Because, it, for instance, in my case, sometimes I sell pre-sales. Yesterday, I was talking to a client that is going to, to get a pre-sale that is going to be delivered three years from now. And she was asking me like, okay, so do I need to start my, my Fideicomiso right now? Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, you can, but it's going to be idle sitting there for the next three years. <laughs> How long does it take to, to open the, the Fideicomiso? And, uh, okay, I want to I make it a little bit bigger. And if I'm buying a pre-sale, when do you think it's a good time for me to start doing the, 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 the process? That is a very good question. Every... Uh, case is different, but the promise of service that takes to uh, set up your bank trust is between 15 to 20 business days. And this is starts counting once um, we have the first communication with the beneficiaries. Uh, and also this term will depend a lot on the time that it takes for the parties or in this case, if there's a real estate attorney uh, as an intermediary. How much does it take for them to send us an integration of their documentation? Sometimes there may be cases that uh, the beneficiary is going to be a legal entity. So we required um, some sort of documents that must be legalized, notarized in the country that we're admitted. So those type of, of things, those type of cases can take a little bit longer than the usual. But the standard term is between 15 to 20 business days. 
And in between the process uh, comes with our different stages that we can explain them um, late, uh, later uh, in, the, in the talk, in, the, yeah, in this conversation, but it is from 15 to 20 business days. In the, in, when it comes to pre-sales, we can begin setting up the bank trust once we have, if it's, for example, a condominium, once we have the condominium regime and all of the property regularized and inscribed under public and property register, which in this case is the title of property. For example, if you have your condominium regime ready to go, um, your predial, which is your property taxes, claves catastales, which is like the number that um, it is provided for every unit that is ready. Once we have that, we are ready to uh, set up the bank trust individually for every beneficiary. So I know that it may take a little bit longer than the usual because we'll have to wait for the condominium regime to be ready. But when the time comes and when the time is right, we will be happy to start setting up the bank trust for the people who are interested in this. Reason. Yeah, just a little side note on this. The condominium regime, I would say is, in a sense, it could be comparable to the birth certificate of, of the uh, of each individual unit. Like when there's a barren lot where there's nothing, that lot has like just one number in the public record because it's just one property, a barren lot. But then at some point you decide to come in in that one unit, one number, make 45 studios. So in that regard, be I'm going to say maybe a month or a month and a half before the, 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 the development is ready for delivery, for delivery, you can actually obtain the condominium regime because it's, it's also subjected to an inspection. So the inspector needs to go and see that whatever you asked in the uh, in the license, the construction license, is effectively what has been built. So they require the property to be built up to 99%. So that condominium regime, which again is like a birth certificate, a certificate of the of the each individual of the unit, because condominium. yeah. Exactly, because on that on that development, now each one of the of the units has its own number, and that's what, what Natalia is requiring. So then let's say that you bought a pre-sale. It doesn't really matter if it's gonna be delivered one year or three years from now. I think the only important remark here is let's say two months, a month and a half before that, the developer will have the the, the, the documentation that Natalia or any bank for that matter requires for the Fideicomiso and provided that the Fideicomiso takes, what do you say, like 25 days or something like that, we are well within time. So you don't need to, to concern about starting too early or too late. It's, it's the, their timing is, is kind of kind of okay, kind of kind of aligned. But in any case, you were about to tell us about the different stages now that we need to follow uh, in the Fideicomiso. So I leave you to it. Yeah, of course. So pretty much a restricted zone trust, which is the one that uh, all foreigners need to purchase a property in Mexico. Um, it It is consisted in several stages. The first stages is obviously the validation of all their identification identification uh, documents. Um, first, we gather those, which comes with passport, proof of address, utility bill, no older than three months, can be water bill, electricity bill, gas bill uh, from their uh, US or Canadian or their home country residence, just to prove their, their residence. Um, certificate of marriage, if it's applicable, ID of their partner, if it's applicable as well. And some people may ask, why do I need this? This is just according to banking um, institutions law. And we have as a bank, the responsibility to identify all of the controlling beneficiaries of this trust. And also very much importantly, fill out all, all of our know your client forms and of course, the identification of, of the beneficiary substitutes, which is just who are you going to be designating to in case if something ever happens to you. Those are the main um, documents. That's the first stage, just to integrate those documents. Same applies for the seller. And the property, of course, will be there will be some documents required 
about the property, but those will be uh, needed and required moving along the process. So first, integration of the identity uh, documents. Second, the bank institution, the trustee, who is acting as a trustee, has a responsibility to request to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs their permit, the permit of the beneficiary. It's a 50-year permit that allows the foreigners to purchase a property uh, along with this trust and is renewable. That's something that foreign beneficiaries should take into consideration. Once we request this permit, uh, we will be moving along with now the notary. The notary starts working on your public deed, which is the project of deed where the trust contract is going to be reflected. And once your permit arrives and your deed, uh, the deed is ready by the notary, they send it us to the bank to review it and authorize it. And then we are ready to go and you're and the beneficiary, the foreigner is able to schedule the closing date for them to come and sign their deeds to the notary. So that's the whole process itself. Sometimes we know that they can be certain delays um, in several stages, but um, as long as the communication is fluent and everything is um, ready to go towards that closing date because we know that some people need to come and need to travel all the way uh, to Mexico City to sign their property. There is no problem. They have also the, op the option to designate or to grant a power of attorney to someone of their trust. And um, that legal representative can uh, sign that deed if, if the foreigners or if the seller is not here. To sign at the close. Okay, perfect. In, in, I, I think just to, to uh, another side note and something that I think is important that you were mentioning is that uh, the, the you as a buyer you don't need to be in Mexico for the better part of the of the process of, of opening your your bank trust. I mean, you do need to be in Mexico to sign the title, which would you be signing with the with the, with the commission and everything else. But for the better part of it, requesting the foreign affairs permit and sending your documentation and signing the initial forms in pretty much everything that Natalia can, can require from you, you can just do it from the comfort of your home and at that same time start preparing for, for your upcoming trip because 25 days from when the moment in which you start the process, you will be needing to be in Mexico to sign the title. But yeah, it's not like you have to be coming and going. You can just plan one trip. You come down there, you sign your title, your fideicomiso, you get your keys and that's it. That's about the process. In important, the next uh, thing is what's, uh, what's the costs associated? How much does it cost to open and to maintain the fideicomiso? Because are, those are two different things, right? Exactly. And that's a very, very important point. Um, just wanted to add a little bit of what you were mentioning in the previous point. Um, exactly. You, uh, the beneficiary nor the seller, uh, need to be here present in Mexico. We can all do it electronically and with uh, remote communication. All the documents can be sent, again, electronically. Even if it requires an post or a legalization or notarization, that can be done and it can be sent electronically, but we do need um, the people or the beneficiaries or the parties present in the closing um, or through their uh, legal representative. Um, and on your second point, um, I believe, oh, the cost depends a lot in the bank that you are going to be setting up your bank trust. But in the case of Intracam, which is what we're, what we're now here for, Um, for the permit of Secretary of Foreign Affairs, it has a cost of $24,500 Mexican pesos, includes tax. And for the trust fees, we require, uh, there's a cost of about 400, uh, 450 USD plus tax for the concept of accepting the trust and 450 USD plus tax for your annuity in advance. And You will be paying like in the, as a first payment, you would be paying already your payment, your annuity in advance, which is obviously a huge advantage. So you don't need to worry about the first year. 
And from there, with Intercam, your payments, your annual, your annual payments are still the same, 450 USD, until the fifth year. The fifth year, um, it increases $50. And so on. Every 50 years, it will be increasing 50, 50 USD. But yeah, that's that's the cost implied when you first set up your bank trust. In case, which is super important, in case if the beneficiary would ever want to make a modification to their trust, there's also a um, a cost implied, which is 450 USD per modification. What do I mean with modification? As I mentioned, designating a new beneficiary substitute, um, terminating the trust because I became Mexican, um, or even, I don't know, just extending the, the permit, the 50 year permit because it got expired. But yeah, just for people to know and for everybody to know as well. Oh well, yeah, and now that you're talking about making these modifications, one very relevant modification, I would say this is actually the beneficiary because the, the bank trust can actually be transferred. I mean, I've seen the cases in which the, the, the bank trust is just canceled and the new buyer, a new, I mean, provided that he's a foreigner, just opens a new bank trust. But let's say that one foreigner wants to sell to another. One scenario, one possible scenario is that you actually can transfer that trust. And so, I mean, it will save you some money. That's about it. Uh, but just just for you, my friends, to know that that process actually exists if ever you come across to, to that situation. And so just to, to drop things up, and I think this is very important, they have a very, very comprehensive system. They have absolutely an amazing experience dealing with, with, with foreigners and uh, exchange of, of currencies. And there's a lot of things. Intercam overall is a bank that is very focused on dealing with foreigners and right now if the memory serves me well you have uh, a little vision that that comes or is explained as a uh, one-step uh, banking you know one-stop banking where you offer a whole umbrella of, of a whole array of products including the fideicomiso and uh, some other things that all what i'm saying is you as a foreigner if you decide to work with Intercam, you will have a number of products that are going to ease you in, not just into buying your property, but potentially into integrating to the Mexican community and whatnot. So just to, to finish here, I would say, Natalia, how, how can Intercam uh, help foreigners looking to buy property in, in the Riviera Maya? Yeah. Thank you very much for, for your previous words. Uh, eventually, indeed, Intercam works as a one-stop shop banking experience and part of offering this one-stop shop banking experience for foreigners and even for nationals, we pretty much provide um, foreigners in Riviera Maya and in any other region of Mexico. We have 70 branches at the end of the day that are assisting them constantly. We provide them all of the services that they need in order to make that purchase happen. Um, in terms of the trust, we have a delegate representative that signs in the behalf of the Mexican bank as a trustee. In Riviera Maya, we have a few of them. Not only we have one, that they're present there. And it facilitates the, uh, the assistance and the consultancy that all foreigners need when they come to invest in real estate uh, in Riviera Maya. Also, we have a, um, a trust specialist in that region that will be helping along the way of all of this process that I just mentioned. We'll be providing you cost, we'll be providing you um, all of the details that are implied, even the list of notaries, notary publics that we work with at our, that have been working with the bank. So they have a very, very good reputation. And as well, just in terms of having to uh, assist them along this purchase, not only do we offer this, as you mentioned, the trust services, but we also provide life insurances, property insurance, car insurance. If it, it depends a lot in the type of the lifestyle that this foreigner wants to uh, begin here in Mexico, right? But usually when they purchase a property is because they see themselves 
in a future living in Mexico. And for that, Intercamp is very uh, focused on having to give them as, most, as much as comfort, teas and services to make that dream happen. So also, as you mentioned, ex exchange currencies, open up, open up bank accounts. We are the only bank account that um, open bank accounts to foreigners only with their passport. Mexican residency nor permanent uh, res temporary residency are not required to do so. Um, and as well as investments, investments, um, even Mexican loans we have Right now, we have a, a huge uh, mortgage home loan. It's called the Dream Loan. That has been a huge success for um, a lot of our clients, foreign clients that, that wants to purchase and start a life here in Mexico. Okay, perfect. So, my friends, I want to take this moment to just remind you that if you like the content that we're doing in this channel, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, just uh, hit that that little bell thing so you keep updated with all of the uh, new content that we upload, we're uploading weekly. And in the case that the information covered right now, you have any other more questions or, or comments, make sure to leave them down below in the comments and we're gonna get back to you. And so, um, Natalia, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for, for thank you. sharing with us all this information. I know the Fideicomiso is a little bit of a complex subject for, for foreigners. And I think that the information that you brought here today, I, I'm sure is going to be very helpful for them. So, Natalia, thank you so much for your time. And uh, well, to the next one. Thank you so, so, so much.